Welcome to a single serving podcast. I'm your host, Shaney Silver, and I want to change the narrative around being single because so far it's had pretty bad PR. What if we stopped seeing single life as wrong and stopped trying so hard to fix it by finding partnership at any cost? Relationships are amazing and we deserve to have them. We just don't deserve to be miserable in the meantime. If you're ready to stop hating single life and to recognize that loving single life doesn't mean you'll be single forever, keep listening. This podcast publishes new episodes every Monday. You can find one episode per month on all your favorite free access platforms. All other weekly episodes are accessible by becoming a patron of this podcast on Patreon. You'll find the link in the show notes for this episode. By becoming a patron, you'll also get access to the Facebook group for this podcast, a supportive community space for celebrating single life, not just for dealing with it. There is so much joy, freedom, and potential in being single. My fear is that if we only ever see our singlehood as something that's wrong with us, something that has to be fixed as soon as possible by finding a partner, we'll miss out on a really important time in our lives, and we might even settle for less than what we really want. If you're sick of the shame of being single and sick of feeling helpless and unable to feel better, this is your podcast, and I'm so glad you're here. Hi, everybody. How are you? I am in a fantastic mood, I'll have you know, and that's because today I'm going to get my first Manny Petty in 15 months. So thoughts and prayers for the individual who's about to have to work with me. I'm fully vaccinated. Don't worry. I will be safe. So we're going to handle that today. And that's, that's super fun. I've really enjoyed my, um, you know, sort of deep dive into press on nails over the last year, but I think we can give them a rest for a little while and stick to stick to my nails, uh, in color. I think that's what we'll do for just a little while. A really fun episode for you today, but before I get into it, a few things. I wanted to tell everyone listening to this episode about all of the episodes on Patreon that have happened over the last month. They were incredible. I had so much fun recording them. And I wanted to tell you about them in case you're interested in listening. The first one is with Rowan Ellis. Rowan and I got into a discussion of asexuality and aromanticism, and those topics have been requested by this audience, and this is the first time that I was able to bring someone on to discuss those topics at length, and it was a fantastic discussion. I loved speaking with Rowan. Um, We had a great chat, and um, we're both super confused about why there's no LGBTQ cafes in London. That was a thing that was rather shocking to me. I was like, really? How is that not How is that not something that exists? Anyway, it was a great chat. I loved speaking with Rowan. And um, then after that, I talked to Laura Banky. And I think Laura's episode is the most popular episode I've done on Patreon yet. I spoke with Laura because I also had audience requests to speak to someone who had never been in a relationship. And um, you guys should know that that scenario is way more common than you think. And if you've never been in a relationship, you are not alone at all. Um, until she met her husband at 35 and a half, Laura had never been in a relationship before. It was just a great, great discussion. I feel like Laura and I are going to be friends. I say that about so many guests and I tell them that they're my friends, whether they want to be or not. So Laura, if you're listening, we're friends now. Uh, it's a great chat. Everybody on Patreon absolutely loved it. Everyone in the Facebook group loved it. So, um, I strongly encourage you to, uh, join the Patreon if you would like to listen to it. And then the last April Patreon episode, why is my voice so weird today? Can you guys hear this? It's so, I don't understand. Allergies, allergies. I'm sorry. That's why my voice sounds odd to me. It probably sounds fine to you because none of you ever have problems with the way things sound on this podcast, because you're absolute heroes and you're the most incredible community on the planet. So, um, all right, I will power through the weird throat scratchiness. The last April episode on Patreon is with August McLaughlin. Um, August and I talk about sex. We talk about a lot of different things in the world of sex and sexuality. And, uh, specifically as those topics relate to being single, um, I had such I, every time, every time I'm the luckiest podcast host alive. I love talking to all of my guests so much. August is the author of a book called girl boner. Um, you can also check that out in the show notes for this episode. Um, but it was just, it was amazing to, to talk about sex in a way that I felt really comfortable, which is something that's kind of hard for me. So I loved, um, I loved our chat so much those episodes, as well as all of the Patreon episodes for March, February, and January 
are all waiting for you over on Patreon. My Patreon is where I publish this podcast once a week. You may have noticed if you're a longtime listener that now this podcast publishes once a month to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Stitcher and all the other free access platforms. So this podcast primarily exists over on Patreon and um, it's $5 a month or roughly $1.25 per episode. And I did that so that I could keep making this podcast forever. And um, after two years-ish of doing this podcast for free, I wanted to monetize it so that I could keep going uh, because it's not possible to create this much for free for this long. So um, I hope that if you are enjoying this podcast, um, and specifically if you're finding it helpful, I really want this to be a supportive and helpful um, bit of content for single people that for once does not revolve around dating. Um, and if that's something that you're enjoying, that's helpful to you. If you would consider joining my Patreon, that would mean so much to me. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is something that has come up in the podcast or podcast, the Facebook group before, and it's come up among my friends before. And I just thought it might be helpful to, to get into this topic a little bit. So I will. So I want to talk about scenarios in which your married and partnered friends don't get it. And what I mean by don't get it is they cannot fathom what it's like to be single right now in our current modern dating landscape. Um, they also just can't fathom what it's like to be single at the age that you are single now. Uh, they can't fathom what it's like to be single for a decade of your adulthood, things like this. The, the scenarios that are unique to single people, specifically to single women, that someone who's never experienced them maybe it's friends, maybe it's family. They cannot fathom what it's like because they've never experienced it. And I know that when we have friends and family who don't get it, the that's a really frustrating situation. That doesn't feel good because it feels like you're alone. It feels like no one understands you. It also feels like no one understands how hard it is. And if no one understands how hard it is, then nobody can understand why you maybe aren't in such a good mood right now, or why you're exhausted, or why you can't just meet someone. There's a lot of things that are not understandable about single life if you're not living it. And I want to tell you that that's okay. It's totally okay when married and partnered people don't get it. Their perspective is not our perspective and different perspectives are allowed. Um, and remember that we don't understand their situation either. The other day I texted something that I had written to um, a friend of mine who's also a writer just to get her thoughts on it. I thought that I was being like a total bitch and I was just like, am I being a total bitch? It's fine if I am, but I like want someone else's opinion on this. So I sent it to her to read and she didn't get it. She didn't understand the very scenario that I was describing. The tone of my writing was even harder to get because she didn't understand the scenario at hand. And it was something that you guys would have understood instantaneously. There's just a gap between perspectives and that's okay. That doesn't mean that we can't be friends with people in couples. That doesn't mean that we can't have meaningful discussions and learn about each other. Um, I think that coupled people and single people should hang out all of the time. I think we should hang out all the time. And I think we should talk about way more than relationship stuff because single people partner up and coupled people separate and your friendship relationships ships. I can't get that out. Sometimes words are difficult. Um, your friendship relationships should never be dependent on your friends, romantic relationships. All of this should be independent because things change. Things are, you know, we, we think about partnering in marriage and everything is this like solid change that is in place forever and forever and forever. But we know that's not true. So let's be a little bit more cognizant of that and understand that life has changed. Relationships change, but we get to be friends with whoever we want, regardless of if they're single or married or whatever. I think it's unnecessary to tie our friendships to their relationships. And I know it happens that people partner up and you see them less or, you know, all of your friends are married and you suddenly feel in social situations like you have nothing to contribute to the conversation or you don't feel as welcome as you used to. Um, I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like intimately, but it's worth trying to push past that. It really is because there's so much more to friendships than relationship status. I know that's kind of an obvious thing, but if you've never heard anyone say it, it's true. Um, we can talk to people with different perspectives in all areas of life, by the way. Um, but this one is one that's really, um, 
it's really worth putting, putting time and effort into because our friendships are so valuable. If you're a single person right now, you know how valuable friendships are. And, um, I know how frustrating it is when you're married and partner friends simply don't get it. One thing that I think could be helpful in scenarios where, um, you, you feel like there's a distance between you and a friend of yours who's married or partnered, um, especially if they've never been single or they were only single in their early twenties or maybe their late twenties and you're in your thirties or forties now, and they just can't fathom what you're going through. They can't fathom what this is like. It can be really helpful to say to them, you know, I'm not looking for advice. I'm not looking for a fix to this. I just need you to be my friend and listen to me. That can be helpful because a lot of the scenarios in single life to the outside world just come across as problems or as like a lack situation. And it can come across like you just need advice to fix it because they don't know. They don't know what it feels like. They don't know that you just need someone to know that this happened. You just need to like get it off your chest a little bit and have someone listen to you and, you know, like hold your hand and know that you're not alone. They don't know that. They think you're asking for advice, but you might not be. So it's okay to tell them, I just need you to listen to me. I don't need you to try to fix this. And by the same token, let them know that you can do the same for them. You can listen to marital problems and stuff. By the way, that's like a great education for the future. Just saying, um, you can let them know that you're there to listen. You're not trying to fix them and you're not trying to judge them. Um, it's, I don't want there to be any sort of barrier between single friends and married friends because, um, I know how they feel. I know they don't feel good and I know it can feel like you're losing friends and I don't want anyone to feel like that. Um, because my married friends, those are really valuable relationships in my life. And I like to think I'm a valuable relationship in their life as well. So, um, friendships are different. Friendships are independent of relationship status in my opinion. And, um, to the extent that, that partnered people don't understand what we're going through. Um, yeah, they don't, that's going to happen it's impossible for them to understand what we're going through. That doesn't make them, um, lesser friends of ours. That doesn't make them, you know, not smart. It just means that they don't know what this is like because they're not going through it. I don't know what marriage is like because I'm not going through it, but that doesn't mean I'm not curious. It doesn't mean I'm not a, uh, a friend who can listen. So if you're feeling like, um, there are walls between you and your married and partner friends, try to, try to weasel your way in there a little bit. Um, as, as we all get vaccinated and the world opens up, there will be hopefully uh, more times for us to hang out as groups again, safely. And I know what it feels like to be a single person in a group of married people. Um, it does not feel good, but it can, it absolutely can feel good. And a separation of your relationship status or their relationship status from the friendship can be really helpful. And it's entirely possible for partnered people and single people to be really supportive to each other without trying to fix each other or give each other advice that probably won't work because you don't have each other's perspective. So, um, it's not about giving each other advice. It's not about trying to fix each other. It's just about being there and listening and, um, valuing, valuing each other for the friendship. So I hope that is helpful. Um, just something I wanted to talk about today. And since it's my podcast, I can, what else do I want to tell you? Oh, I have an amazing guest for you today. <laughs> do your job, Shaney. Um, Alex Kruger is a writer, a really talented writer that I discovered. I hate the word discovered and discover him. He's not like a new planet. Um, so on Instagram, I was going through my Instagram stories and an internet friend of mine posted something from a real life friend of hers. He is a writer that wrote for modern love. And, um, if you guys read the New York times, if you're familiar with modern love, it was also a Netflix series. Modern love is a column about love in, in various formats. Um, I used to pitch to them all the time. And then I realized it was just another source of rejection and I didn't need that. So I stopped submitting to modern love, but Alex did it and it worked and modern love published his piece that is so cool and so well-written and so relevant for singles. And anytime that modern love publishes something for single people, it makes me really happy. Um, the most popular episode of this podcast ever by a mile is an episode with Sarah Eckel, who wrote a piece for modern love that was then transformed into a book called 27 wrong reasons you're single. And it's one of my favorite books for singles ever, 
ever. It's one of my favorite books in general, ever. Um, I'm going to link to her episode in the show notes as well. If you haven't heard it, listen to it. If you haven't heard it in a while, listen again. It's outstanding. And so is this episode with Alex. I loved chatting with him about, like, we get into some really good stuff, some really good realities of dating, both from the straight perspective and the gay perspective. And I really think that this is a cool thing to listen to if you're feeling a little bit alone. If you're feeling like no one gets it, if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling like there are certain realities of dating and of life that other people just don't get, hang out with me and Alex for a while because we had a really good time and this is a fun conversation that I'm so happy to share with you. Obviously, I will link to his piece in Modern Love below in the show notes. Um, It's excellent. I really want you to read it. And I think, is that all I want to talk to you about today? We can make that all I want to talk to you about today. I think so. God, the allergies are so bad. They've never been like this in the entire time that I've lived in New York. And now they have hit me like something very large, heavy, and fast. And I don't like it. Um, If you have not had a chance to join the Patreon, get over there. There is one episode of this podcast publishing every week. And your support makes sure that I can keep doing this podcast forever and ever. So thank you to everyone who uh, has already joined the Patreon. You guys are the reason this podcast exists. Thank you for your support and for being an amazing community. Thank you for everything you're contributing into the Facebook group for Patreon patrons. Um, I love how positive that space is. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with other Facebook groups in the world, but they can turn into some pretty negative places that essentially just exist for people to bitch into them. And I don't care if that sounds judgmental. I'm in many of those groups for observational purposes. I see this happening and it hurts my heart because I think we need more places where we're supporting each other rather than just like venting at each other and saying, Oh yeah, that was terrible. That happened to me too. 18 times. No, like how can we support each other and do things that are productive and like, (sighs) I hate using the word like less negative because that implies that there's something like I'm not trying to create a false positivity around singlehood. I don't like false positivity or toxic positivity, but I think everything that's out there for us right now, most of it is pretty negative and we do deserve a positive supportive space where we get to talk about singlehood. Like it's not the worst goddamn thing ever because it isn't. So if you're in the Facebook group right now, if you're a patron and you're contributing in there, thank you so much because you're creating a space that I feel good every time I go in there. And I don't feel that about other Facebook groups. So that's because of you. Thank you very much for, for what you contribute. Thank you for sharing your like singlehood wins in there. Um, I think just yesterday, somebody was like, I made a new friend in the wild. And that was outstanding. She, she made a new friend on a walk, like literally made a new friend. Like they have each other's phone numbers. They're going to go get coffee. Like we have to hear this stuff. We have to hear good stuff. The Facebook group for this podcast for patrons is a place for good stuff. And I like that. I like that 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 has become a place of joy and support. And yeah, sometimes tough stuff happens too, to me as well. And I post in there when really tough stuff happens. Um, When my cat passed away, I posted in there and everyone was so supportive of me and I really needed it in that moment and I appreciated it. But, um, for the most part, we're sharing some, some really cool wins that matter to us. Um, when maybe the outside world doesn't necessarily see our wins as, as big as we see it. So I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'll blame that on the allergies too. It's just a really nice space. It's a really nice space for single people. And I'm so proud of it. So if you join the patron patron, if you join the Patreon, for this podcast, you also have access to that Facebook group if you would like it. Um, so that's, that's everything I want to cover today. I'm going to get into the interview with Alex. Thank you all so, so much for listening to this podcast. I hope you enjoy the public episode for the month of May. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and getting vaccinated and taking Claritin if you're anything like me. And, um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much for listening, you guys. Alex Kruger, welcome to the podcast. We are chatting today because an internet friend of mine and a real friend of yours posted something on her Instagram, and uh, I knew I had to reach out. For those listening, um, you might be familiar with a little something called uh, Modern Love. It's, you know, it's a thing that the New York Times does, and um, longtime listeners of the podcast will have no doubt heard Sarah Eccles' episode of this podcast. She was also a Modern Love columnist, and you guys really loved her episode um, because it's the most popular one I've ever run. So um, I'm going to talk to Alex now because he also 
wrote for Modern Love and I was absolutely obsessed with it. So I reached out. Alex, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. What would you want an audience of single people to know as we begin our conversation? Uh, well, first, thank you for having me on the show. Appreciate My pleasure. Um, let's see. Uh, I would want everyone to know that I am single, right? So I think that's a good one. Uh, despite writing a piece in you know, Modern Love, you would think that you're supposed to do that after you're in love. I've seen a lot of them where people write them and they say, you know, now I can talk about having how, about finding love because it looks like I figured it out, right? So uh, oh, as Because heaven the... forbid singles know how to love in this life, of course. I know, right? It's a, it's a strange world we live in where that's the case, but uh, <laughs> or that's the perceived case. But um, uh, let's see, single, living in L.A., um writing mostly comedy and business stuff and a lot of different projects there yeah okay you're being really modest you guys need to read his modern love piece i'm going to put it in the show notes obviously um but it it stood out to me so much both because it's really well written and i'm a writing nerd so i'm drawn to good work but also just because um it was a very relatable moment and um how do I want to get into, because it's hard to talk about like articles and stuff on a podcast because I'm not going to read them word for word, but I am going mm-hmm. to describe it a bit. I think this is how I'll start. Yeah, um, so my favorite part of your piece, first of all, I should high level. It's about Alex's experience making um, spreadsheets that pertain to dating. Why am I saying this? You tell them what it's about. You know it okay. better. Okay, okay, okay. So from the highest level, uh, the piece was about uh, this thing called a Trello board that I have, which is essentially um, a project management tool used in software, mostly to keep track of all the different tasks that are happening. Um, I use it for a lot of pieces in my life, but I started using it for dating, I think, six or seven years ago, just to keep track of everyone I was going on dates with and to try to figure out, you know, what was happening in my life that was causing me to be less like single, but more so like And for me, it was less, why am I single? And more so, why are these dates bad, right? And so it was kind of more of a a time-saving thing than anything else. Um, But yeah, that's so the piece is about the genesis of that um, and how that all came to fruition and uh, whether or not it's worked and how it hasn't. But there's a little like hopeful twang at the end, so. I feel like that's why we're friends. I make spreadsheets for everything too. Um, Literally everything. I have a life admin spreadsheet, like master list in- Mm -hmm. Uh, Google spreadsheets or whatever. And there's a tab for absolutely everything. There are no fewer than three tabs dedicated to my upcoming move (laughs) and everything you can possibly imagine is, is organized in there because I used to be that kind of girl that was like, Oh, I should save that link. I want to make that recipe. And then nothing would ever happen. And, but that would happen with like 18 different areas of my life. So now I have a spreadsheet with tabs and I still don't make the recipes, but they're there if I want them. I'm the same way I have. um, I think four or five that I'm using at all times that are, all crazy but i love i love them they make my life so much better i feel like often people just throw things into their uh into their notes app you know and then they just into it's like you clear your brain from the anxiety you have about not being able to remember a thing but then that thing just goes into the ether and then you never look at it again and so and so i don't know they've they've i don't know these spreadsheets have been so have been life-changing for me don't you feel better when you make one i just feel better so i mean yeah i have um so the dating one i have it's probably similar to your life admin one. I have like a 30 day planning one, which is just like everything that's happening. Um, so like every day I have a to-do list in Trello and then I have a done. And so at the end of every day, I just drag all over the to-do things to the done. Even if the done things I'm doing were crappy, right? So even if it was like, you know, talk with my mom or like, you know, move that box across the floor, right? Or work out. And it's not just, and it's not a work thing. Like maybe it's not, you know, find a client, but it still makes me at the end of the day, look at the done list and feel accomplished, which I think a lot of these spreadsheets are sure it's organization, but it's also about like tricking yourself, which is, I guess what the, um, the modern love piece is about is kind of like your ability to trick yourself into feeling that you're in control to make yourself feel less lost. Right. So it's, for me, it's more for like a, an anxiety coping tool than anything else. I love anxiety coping tools. They're vital in my opinion. I think yeah. they're fantastic. It's also nice to have uh, organization apply to areas of life that are not work. I think sometimes we can prioritize work and make that the area where we really like shine and fire on all cylinders. And then in personal life, things can be a bit more messy, but I like the idea of an organized personal life as well. And I don't think that makes me a huge nerd. I agree with you, especially because the work stuff, I feel like you can often be less organized because 
your subconscious is so dedicated to perform well because otherwise you get fired, right? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. no one's gonna fire you for being shitty at life. And so someone needs to keep control of that, that of that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to fire you for being shitty at life is your first Instagram quote. I would just want you to know that that's yeah, gonna yeah. happen. Um okay, so I do want to read uh, a little bit from this piece because uh I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done. And um, this audience, I think, will also find it very relatable. Um, So I'm going to quote you really quickly. Um, So a a bit of the piece has to do with you being on a uh, dating television show of sorts. And you were recanting, recanting, recounting, recounting, recounting your experience being on it. Um, And so you wrote, the reason they brought me on the show is because my standards were too high. I had crazy lists of dating requirements that they assumed came from my deep fear of commitment, as if I were sabotaging myself with a system that would exclude nearly everyone. First of fucking all, can standards ever be too high? So I think, I think there's a couple things here. So there's a difference between like, uh, standards that they brought me on or things that they were saying were too high for the show versus like a bigger picture of like, what are your standards you hold for what you need from someone? I think, I think that uh, what makes a good reality TV show is having someone uh, who looks like they're nuts and they need help and then you fix them. Right. Like that's the arc of like most reality TV shows that are right. And so they even said that to me, like after we were there, uh, which was like, I think where I was a little too optimistic. I was like, oh, they're just going to talk about my Trello board. But it was like, no, they're going to make me look. And I was like, and I told, I'm not the victim here, right? Like I signed up for this thing because I thought it'd be fun to try this thing out. Um, um, so I think like thing one is, yeah, they, I gave them, I showed them the spreadsheet and I was like, hey, or the Trello board. And I was like, hey, here is what they are. And then I think when, I think they were just kept trying to like push me to show uh, high, like more, vapid standards or have mo- like many many more standards that it would look better for the show because at the end of the day these reality tv shows want to help people you know like the, the like you a viewer so? watching this show i don't know i mean you want to think so. i don't i mean maybe right like um that one specifically i think a goal is you know was was like uh let's have the viewers watch this and hopefully uh hopefully they'll take away something from this that will make their life better it wasn't like um it wasn't like, I mean, I don't know enough reality TV shows. It wasn't like a hoarders thing where you're just like, shame these people for their problems. <laughs> it was very much like the host was awesome. And she was like, no, she, like she's described herself as, some, as more of like, I'd say like a Dear Abby person who wants to make a difference. But going back to your original question, I think standards can be too high when the things you're picking are not things that will actually make you happy. I think that's the real problem you know when you just don't know what you want and you're like i want someone hot and tall and you know and like i think then you end up um happy unhappy later on i would agree with that i would absolutely agree with that i get very insulted when people tell singles that their standards are too high i think it's just like another way of calling them unattractive and undesirable to their face i really don't like that same thing when someone's like you're too picky really Becky were you when you found your husband or did you just like take the first person who came along I really don't like it when people criticize singles standards as if they need to lower them or they're never going to find love and will thus always be a sad single forever that shit kind of makes me mad but I like your explanation more because it's definitely more positive and probably more true I totally agree with you especially because I often find that asking your friends that are in relationships for advice is just not very helpful right because or taking feedback from people who are in relationships because to your point right like uh meeting someone who who makes you feel a certain way is a very very hard thing to systematize and quantify and um everyone looks for different things so that changes like the probability that they're going to meet someone that checks those things versus whatever your uh things are that you're looking for right so at the end of, i don't know i just to your point right like i have a friend who just broke up and yeah, sure. They they were a good match for a while. Not only did they break up, but like I would have never dated that person. And that's how, you know what I mean? So it's just like, uh, I think dating advice is always very um, easy to give after you're in a happy relationship. It's also extremely convenient because if you give dating advice and it works, you're a hero. If you give dating advice and it doesn't work, the person you gave it to didn't follow it correctly. I find that really fucking convenient and I don't like it. Dating advice yeah. gives someone who's not explicitly asking somebody for genuine specific dating advice is just 
I think it's an indication of people not necessarily wanting to help someone else, but wanting to feel helpful themselves because no one can tell you where to find what you're looking for. I'm very sorry about the ambulance. This audience is used to it. Believe me. Um, It's like no one can tell you where to find what you're looking for. So I don't know what kind of advice we're necessarily giving. It's usually got something to do with like, like pointing to a, a supposed flaw or something you need to change or alter when it's really your authenticity, who you actually are that is going to draw people to you. Um, Just like someone else's authenticity is what's going to draw you to them. Um, But I really like what you said about what we're looking for. And if it's not really the things that are going to make us happy, which don't have so much to do with, you know, height and how cute is he, although those things are fun. um, It's really more about how you want to feel in a relationship. And I think that can take a little bit of time to, to grasp, but um, answer my question very well. Thank you so much. Um, what about, oh, the next thing I want to ask you about this, this particular um, section of your piece was, um, why do you think a list of dating requirements came across as crazy to a reality show team at all? Like, I kind of think it's just something that's organized. Hmm, I would say... Um... I would say that having this, having the list isn't crazy. Talking about it is probably right. You know, um, I remember when the first time I got caught with the list, there was this guy I was seeing and he heard from one of my friends that I had a list of like an Excel, you know, it got lost in no way. They didn't say Trello board. (laughs) So they definitely miss understood but uh i remember in bed one time like we were were, like a few months into dating and we're lying in bed and he looked at me he's like hey am i on a spreadsheet of some kind and i was like shit you know like oh no i what do i do and i and i i I laughed about it and i held my ground and i said something probably arrogant that was like uh yeah it's the only reason you're here you know something (laughs) like that probably you know (laughs) and then we talked through it and it was helpful um um, but I think, I think people like after I posted the article, I started getting, I have so many messages from so many people that, uh, you know, um, I met my husband, you know, it was one she's like, I met my husband only because I built an Excel also. And then this other guy was like, yeah, I have a, I've always kept track of every woman I've dated and I've tried to analyze like, what I'm looking for and it led me to find my wife. And like, maybe those things are true. I think the causation is a little like unfair. Right. But it's still like, I think the fact that uh, keep being organized and understanding what you want is not a crazy thing, but maybe talking about it is crazy because I don't know if you look neurotic or desperate or lost, but I think that's what they probably were like. Yeah. This is the thing that I think for them, it was just like, this is the thing that will fare well for an episode, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, but exactly, exactly your point. Those people contacting you, you're talking to them right now, because I know there are a lot of people listening that are going to be in a very similar boat, maybe not with a Trello board, maybe it's a sauna. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> something, something that is a um, sequel model, an abacus. Yeah. <laughs> something that's helping them feel a little bit more like this isn't just the most random and punishing space ever because dating is, I, I mean, I don't know how it is on your side of the fence, but on ours, it's an absolute <laughs> hellhole. It's been referred to on this podcast as a nest of vipers, which I thought was a really cool description. Um, but it can be, it can be very difficult and it can be very difficult for a very long time. And I like the idea of, like, I don't really talk about dating too much on this podcast, but when I do, I like it to be relatable and productive, not just telling horror stories because we live enough of those, but I like it when it can be told from an angle that's interesting and that's authentic um, and that people can identify with and maybe feel like not crazy. I think that's Yeah, I think dating is really hard, right? Because there's, it is the... Uh, you have to put yourself out there and get rejected. And that is, it is very hard to be, uh, because if you're not vulnerable, you won't find what you're looking for. And if you are vulnerable, then you'll inevitably get hurt. So you're almost signing up for, you must be willing to sign up for unhappiness for an interim, right? And that's, uh, that sucks. Um, Do you, what what do I want to ask? God, so many things, so many things. I write these and then we just go off the rails and that's usually the best parts, but so th- am I allowed to ask you questions also? If you want to, go for it. Okay, cool. Well, I, can you talk to me more about when you say you're not dating, mm-hmm. what does that mean? So a few years ago, I decided that um, 
dating apps were a huge source of unhappiness for me. And they were very dangerous to my mental health. And I looked at them and I looked at 10 years of consistent use on and off when you, you know, delete and then redownload. But by and large, for a, <laughs> the inevitable sad cycle. Sure, yeah. um, I did that for a decade, <laughs> for 10 full years. And I never had one relationship result from any of that effort. And after that decade, I like finally asked myself, what are these apps giving you? What are they contributing to your life? And all they were giving me was negative things that I had to deal with and process and, you know, try not to let them hurt me too badly. And I just thought I can get rid of this forever because it's never given me anything good. The return on investment, both emotionally and financially, by the way, was zero. So understanding for myself that they had never given me anything was how I deleted them forever. I haven't redownloaded them since it was January 26th, 2019. And I haven't touched them since, but more than anything, I haven't wanted to. And it was like the first time I understood that I'm allowed to just live. I can just live my life and meet people that way too. And if uh, what people say, whenever I tell them this, that I'm not like actively in pursuit of a partner, they're like, aren't you lowering your chances? But I gave dating apps 10 years of chances and it couldn't materialize for me even once. So I think the chances are exactly the same doing nothing that they were doing everything. And we'll just see how it goes. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair. I think COVID probably, I mean, I don't want to speak for your experience, but COVID probably makes that harder to meet people serendipitously, right? Or at least for me, because I'm not doing the, you know, in gatherings. Yeah. But I was okay with that. I think if um, there was a lot of talk when the pandemic started, like, how are singles going to date? What are we going to do? Oh, no. How are we going to help singles date? And I was getting all these PR emails about, like, we're adding video chat to these eight Mm -hmm. dating apps of ours and bullshit like that. And the thing was, I didn't understand why we couldn't just say, maybe we don't date right now. Maybe we can't. Maybe people are dying. And that's more important. And we don't have to worry about how the singles are going to get laid. Like maybe we can just let go and not have to drive and focus toward finding singles, somebody. I just, I thought maybe we could let go and that be okay for a little while. Um, But I've also done so much work to not panic about being single, to not panic about not being able to meet people. So it doesn't freak me out the way it used to, but it did for 10 years And then I figured out how to stop the panic. And that's why this podcast that you're on exists. Totally. Yeah. And I feel like you're the face of someone who is calm with that, right? Right. Who can stay calm in that unknown, right? Where, as I'd say, and which is why this podcast exists, right? I'd say most people are not as, um, I guess, confident as you are in that, you know, which is right. Like, I, like I know myself, um, I haven't dated much in the past year, right? But I think that um, I think that not per, like if I'm meeting a bunch of people in real life, and then you know maybe hooking up with people or like going on dates or like trying to find a boyfriend, right? These things all feel good because to that comment that I guess someone said to you, aren't you lowering your chances, right? The question for me is, you know, um, if I'm doing nothing to progress this thing in my life forward that is that I think is important to me aren't I, aren't I messing up, you know? And that's the, yeah. It's super common. It's, in, I mean, that's what most people think. I'm the anomaly. If anything, everyone's like, if I totally. don't try, if I don't put effort in here, I won't get anything back. And the reverse for me was just like, I put in nothing but effort for a decade and got nothing back. So we're going to kick yep. back for a bit and see who shows up. And that's just been way more fun for me. It's also just been a, an opportunity to understand how much singlehood doesn't suck and how good relationships are going to have to be to compete with it. Because my history of relationships, I've never been in a relationship that was as good as my singlehood right now. Never. I hey, I totally hear you. I think I've grown. I haven't been single for the past like two and a half years, almost three years, and I've grown so much more independently, right? And I think I think that's a good bar that you're setting. Which what is that quote? What is it? Don't let someone find you till you found yourself, right? It's kind of like that, <laughs> you know, like the make sure you got your your act together and your stuff together, and you're happy being alone before you, you know to put all your sadness and make it someone else's problem, you know? Yeah. And it's not like you have to, you don't have to grow or develop or like fix yourself or whatever so that someone can love you. That's not it. It's more about like, Mm -hmm. if you figure out that you can love yourself and love singlehood, you won't be afraid to come back here. If you need to, you won't stay in a shitty relationship. That's not right for you because singlehood won't Mm -hmm. be as scary anymore. 
That's, that's cool. really important. I think for women also, it's incredibly important to be able to say like, I don't have to, I don't have to do this. I do not. Have yeah, you can have a good, you can have a good, your life can be happy even when you're not hitched to someone. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. But yeah, I get it. There's, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the exception and I, I fully feel for everyone who thinks I'm not doing enough. Oh shit. There's a pandemic another year of my life. I'm not going to be able to meet someone. Oh God, what the fuck? This is awful. I get that. I lived in that for 10 years. I fully get it. And, um, there's a way out. There's a way to, there's a way to find like a center and a calmness and still meet really interesting people and like really attractive people and still, you know, move forward with life. And I, I don't know if we talked about this before, but like, I like for single people to um, hear stories about how people met because whereas they might've annoyed us before or just like reminded us of what we didn't have. Mm -hmm. I like people to remind themselves every time they hear a story about how someone met, I like us to remember that it's infinite. People can meet in infinite number of ways, not just on dating apps, but in every way possible because it's just a reminder to yourself that it's not just about dating apps. If you don't like them, if you love them, Godspeed, have the best time ever. But for anyone who doesn't love them, who's not finding success on them, they're not the only way that people come together and fall in love. Far from it. I am I am so surprised that there's anyone that can love dating apps, right? Like yeah. I, for me, I had to, I think if you do what works for you, for me, my rule is no push notifications, no badges, no icons, no like icon badges. Um, and I look at them in bed in the morning for five minutes and then in bed in the evening for five minutes. And that's it. And that's all I'm allowed to do. Right. And that's like, and that's my rule. And uh, I probably have lost a lot of people from, you know, I'm being so disengaged and I can never, you can never carry an actual fluid conversation. Right. But uh, it is helpful because then it's just this thing where I feel like I'm moving it forward, but I don't have to think about it all the time. And then to your point, there's guy that I'm the guy that I like the most right now of every, of like of everyone I've talked, been talking to is I met him through, a work intro and I didn't even know he was gay and we just like and it just like it was I was like oh whoa this is like pretty cool and I would have never I would have never met him on an app like he doesn't have Instagram or Facebook like I would have never like found him in a friend's picture and been like oh that dude's hot I'm gonna go dm him you know like that would have never happened right um I think you're right like that open-mindedness the open-mindedness to the um how you meet the person is important it can be calming it can be very yeah. calming and exciting it's kind of mm -hmm. cool to know that it can happen in literally any way in the world that you can imagine. My grandparents met when they were on dates with other people. It's just, you have no idea. It's like, it's this wonderful world of potential and excitement. And I think we that forget, cool. right? We have that to look forward to. We have my mom and dad met because my dad was running the nursing home that my mom's great aunt was at. <laughs> oh, that's one of my favorites yet. That is one of my favorite ones yet. I have to write that down when we hang up. That is so good. Horrible divorce, though, just for, so you that's know. Okay. Don't, 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 like, retell the story. In a, no, 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 in a no, no. But, like, okay. it's a horrible, like, horrible divorce. It's okay. Divorce <laughs> happens. Those nine. Divorce happens yeah. all the time. Divorce <laughs> happens half the time. Literally half yeah. the time. So it's which is okay. why, which is why the feeling of desperation of like, oh, everyone good's taken is not real because no one's really taken, you know, like half of them are come back on the market, you know. But no one wants to think that because they're about to yeah. spend a lot of money on a wedding. So nobody yeah. wants to think that in their head, but it's no less true weddings are <laughs> they're ridiculous um but i don't shy away from from shitting on them on this podcast because yeah, i'm yeah, really yeah, tired fun. of them being so important yeah. um oh my god we're so off book and it's amazing sorry <laughs> no don't ever apologize um so within the piece you mentioned that lists are a kind of tool that you use to make sure that you don't settle for a good enough relationship actually i think this is probably my favorite thing you said in the piece um why so using spreadsheets to make sure that you don't settle for a good enough relationship what why don't you want a good enough relationship i think it's to your point earlier of like i really do like my life and i like being single right and so um it just doesn't make sense to be stuck with someone because you're scared to be alone right i think it just it just makes no since I mean, I see so many of my friends in those relationships and I remember who they were beforehand and it seems that they're just in them because they're scared. And I just don't, there's been a lot of relationships I've been in where I'm like, oh, I could, I could make this work. I had a friend ask me the other day about some guy I dated and he said, don't you think you two could have made it work? And I was like, probably, but I am happier now than I would have been had I tried to make it work, you know? 
the phrase make it work. Horrible. It's horrible. Because you don't have to. There's no one saying you have to. There's no rule. There's no law saying if you have someone in front of you that could potentially be your partner that you have to make it work. That's just not required. Yeah, there are unlimited people. And also being single is fine as long as you are working it up on yourself where you get your life to a point where you like your life. You know what I mean? Like there's, uh, I think I see so many people who are in relationships just 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 because they don't know how to be alone. And that is super unfortunate. I agree. I agree. Um, There's also 7.6 billion people on the planet the last time I Googled it. And I Googled it recently. And I just feel like that's maybe too many people to feel like, to have that thought in the back of your head, like, oh, there's no good guys left. Everyone's taken. Like that mood is a false narrative that we keep feeding to ourselves. And by the way, we keep feeding ourselves when we keep downloading app after app after app. And it's the same people on every app. Well, no shit. You're you're not only getting a sampling of people who live where you live, but you're also getting a sample of the people who live where you live who would be likely to use a dating app in the first place. It's too narrow of a it's too narrow to be our only option. Dating apps are too mm-hmm. narrow to be our only option. There's a great um Pew Research study that came out in October of 2020, I think, and they interviewed people uh to find out how many relationships were actually resulting from dating apps. And when I saw that gorgeous 12% I'm telling you, I just felt so valid in everything that I like fight so hard to communicate because 12% out of everybody that's using them, that's enough to be like an algorithmic accident. Because if you put millions and millions of people in the same room, by accident, some of them are going to fall in love. I'm sorry. That's just, I don't think that's skill. Why do you think it was so low? Because dating apps are trash. Yeah. I think it's competing goals. I think it's very low because everyone on them has competing goals. Some people are using them for essentially sex work that they don't have to pay for. Some of them are using them because they actually think they'll find a partner. And a good chunk of them are using the apps because they're not real humans. They're just bots. And the dating apps themselves are using single people because the very last thing a dating app wants you to do is delete it. They don't want you to yeah. meet someone at all. That's like, fair. I think a lot of people just use it. I have a friend who I know who just, he said I had to delete them because I was just using it for validation. I didn't want to actually, he's like, I didn't want a girlfriend. I just was, it was just, he's like, when I would feel sad, it was like TikTok or Tinder. He's like, and it just felt good. You know, and he was like, he was like, I'm, he's like, I had to delete it because I noticed myself just like, I wanted the attention and the validation and I wanted people to like me back. And for me, and I didn't actually want a girlfriend. He's like, but it just felt good to be liked. And it's such a human, it's such a human thing that these apps play to, and they're very good at it. And to your point, right? Like the worst thing for the, for revenue for a dating app is a customer that uh, attrits and finds love, right? Like they don't want you to find love. It's like the worst thing that could happen to a casino is that a gambler gets bored. It's the very same thing. They all just want to take your money. They're all running a business. I'm sorry. I wish it was more romantic than that. I really do. I really wish that dating apps had good intentions and maybe at the outset they did, but we're not at the outset anymore. I would love to pay a dating app for how long I'm in the relationship for. (laughs) <laughs> that'd be great i would like to sue all the dating apps for all the money i ever spent with them they didn't get what i paid for i would really like that i think that would be great you kind of have to forgive yourself though for any money you ever spent on a dating app because yes. it's like you chalk it up to an education of another sort you know what i mean they always show you a hot person that's out of your league right before the paywall is what i've noticed of course and that hot person's <laughs> a bot that hot person is not real yeah, yeah totally it's the the things that, you know, what it's weird. I found this out since I downloaded TikTok um, and they're taking out the recycling right now. And everyone listening is going to laugh because now it's a running joke. It doesn't matter when I schedule the recordings. That's when they will decide to take out the recycling in the hallway and make lots of noise in my headphones. Um, but God, what was I talking about two seconds ago? This is what happens when they make noise with the glass. You were bottles. watching TikTok, I think. Yeah. Okay. So I was watching TikTok mm-hmm. and I'm finding out how many for me, I've only seen women do this. I haven't seen men do this. How many women on TikTok are screen grabbing horrific shit from dating apps and then posting them on TikTok and that green screen thing and making fun of them. And you see one and it's like, God, wow, that's really awful. And then you see one and it's like, oh God, yeah, that's really awful. I can't believe that happened to you. And then over and over and over again, it starts to be like, can you believe this shit happened? And I'm like, yeah, I can. What I can't believe is that you're still on that fucking dating app. 
Like, you know that this is what happens and this is all that happens and you hate it and you still keep going back. It's an addiction. It's actually, but it was designed to be an totally addiction. Totally an addiction. Designed. Totally an addiction. Yeah. yeah. It's awful. My friend told me he worked, <laughs> this is a side note. My friend told me he worked for um, like a mobile gaming app and they had to try and monetize, um, get kids to pay tokens to do things. And they, they, they he was tasked like running different tests. And one of the one of the tasks he did is he put a little a puppy in a cage and have it bounce and cry. And in order to unlock the puppy, you had to pay tokens. And it's horrible, right? But that's like that is a proxy for what these apps are doing, right? Like they show you your heart and they show you like something that's gonna fix your sadness and, and then they try and take your money. Yeah, it's a it's a business. Did you ever go to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid? Uh yes. So you would play games and you would get tickets, and at the end you would go get a prize. And the prize would, you know, depend on how many tickets you get. And the that, like, breeding that, like, reward system into our head is wild when you think about the repercussions, repercussions of that as you grow up. Because we were taught, like, if you get tickets, you turn them in and you get a prize. And the more tickets you have, the greater the prize. So, like, essentially, the more you've paid, the bigger the prize you get. But you always got something mm. at the end, right? And with dating mm-hmm. apps, there's absolutely zero guarantee that you will ever get something at the end. And it also, Correct. the notion of like, the more I suffer in this space, the more shit I have to go through in the dating space, that's going to earn me somebody eventually, right? It's, he's going to be great because I've been through such hell in the dating space. He's going to be amazing, right? I don't know. I I hope so. But there's no, yeah. there's no uh, balance. There's no like, there's no amount of effort you can put in that's guaranteed to net you out somebody in the end and there's no amount of suffering that you can do that's definitely going to like earn you a partner ever it's just a it's the wild west and i've just chosen to like leave it really yeah you're i mean the idea that we're all destined to be with someone is like such a funny little like disney farce you know yeah it is but it's also like i also don't think that we're all here to be alone if we don't want to be I really don't think that that's why we're all here to just constantly search for someone until the end of time. It just doesn't seem logical to me, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. There's lots of things you can do with your life to find purpose and happiness and community and connection and love. Right. And then hopefully one of those things ends up being uh, someone you share more experiences with, but um, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that, you know, maybe I won't get married and have kids one day. Right. Um, And that took me a long time to get to. And uh, I'm not, I wasn't saddened when I came to that realization because I looked back on the relationships I've been in, the people I've dated and the growth that came from so many of those. And I can't say that I grew more from one person than I did from like the cumulative many, right? And so when I map out the rest of my life, even just like hypothetically, and I'm like, oh, you know, if one path is singledom, one path is versus a path of like, I find a husband and we spend every day together forever, right? Like the former path isn't filled with loneliness. And I think that's the thing that I had to like figure out, which is like, oh, well, if I like date three people over the next, you know, 40 or 50 years that I'm hopefully alive, and or I'm single for like half of them. Like that doesn't that that life doesn't isn't necessarily a lonely life. I like your outcomes either way, but I think the math is a little unnecessary because I don't think you have any idea what's going to happen to you, unless you're psychic, sure. in which case I have questions. Um, but like mm-hmm. in general, I just don't think that you can have any idea of where things are going to go or what's going to happen. And that's I think that's kind of cool. But your outcome, the end result, is one hundred percent on point like yeah i mean i have no idea right and to yeah. be a psychic that'd be terrible oh my god be so stressed <laughs> all the time <laughs> I, could not do that. I think sometimes it would be convenient like i'd go play the lottery a bunch but you know other than that i don't i kind of like being delighted by life i like being delighted by the future and i think when you are miserably single that's taken away from you i think you start to fear the future if you hate your singlehood and dating is a grind and it's just miserable i think um I think that can steal from us our uh, ability to look forward to the future. And we deserve to be able to look forward to the future. Completely agree. Yeah. I'm going to ask you more questions now, like an actual podcast host. Um, Do you think, so? okay. Is, is having a a sort of spreadsheet system for dating, is it fun? I don't know about the word fun. I mean, I definitely don't, uh, it doesn't make me happy when I use it. Right. It doesn't feel like, going on tiktok which i think is the most fun thing i've ever done in my life um 
Um, but I think it does make me feel um, like I'm in control, right? And I think for me, the issues I struggle with are definitely um, like this, this, the fear of the unknown, right? And so regardless of what the spreadsheet, having a spreadsheet does, just the feeling that I'm in control of my life, whether it's dating or like I have one for like this health issue I've been dealing with and I have another one for like um, content I'm consuming, like from all people who are like, oh, you should watch this show. And then I like, I'm like, oh, I wish I remember that show. Like, like there's like all those things, like it just makes me feel like I'm more organized and centered in those facets of, it sounds, I, I keep saying the word growth, which is just the thing that I like, I'm very, I like, I'm always trying to be, I like probably over optimize around like being too better too often and all the things. But for me, like even having a dating spreadsheet makes me feel less, um, uh, lost, I guess is the right way to think about it. Yeah. Why'd you feel lost before? Um, mm, because I think with dating apps and meeting people and not knowing if I'm spending the right time, the right energy on the people who might matter more to me, uh, yeah, I guess I guess it makes me focus on the things that matter. And without that, I feel like maybe beforehand I was kind of just like running around being like, oh, you know, why am I single? Why are these apps not working? Why are these dates not going well? And that type of like perpetual disappointment didn't feel good. But regardless of if it's true or not, being able to look at a spreadsheet and say, okay, things didn't work out with Ryan because uh, Ryan just didn't like you or things didn't work out with Ryan because you don't like Ryan. And the reason you probably don't like Ryan is because Ryan is like way too materialistic for you, right? Like being able to point to something made me feel like I had a better idea what was going on, which made me feel more in control. Yeah. Is dating fun? I don't think it's that fun. I think meeting people that, um, meeting people that you have a connection with, even if it's for like a month or two months, I think that is like really, really beautiful. And I think we often um, undervalue temporary relationships. And so to me, that stuff is so fun. Like when I meet someone and we have a phone call and it goes well, and we face them, it goes well. And then we meet in person and we're like, oh, there's not a connection, but let's become, yeah, I have a friend right now who, and I think this is much more common in the gay world. It's a smaller community, right? But, and you have like a sense of, um, um, what'd you call that? Like, sympathetic suffering right so like so you know like i like i can go like so many of my close close friends are from people i've met on dates or hooked up with once um, and that's really nice and so in that sense i think dating is fun because you can build people like community of people you love and who love you um but if you're talking about you know dating when you look at the amount of dates you go on that are terrible and horrible that don't work out that part is totally not fun <laughs> Isn't it such a bitch that like time spent with people you enjoy is so wonderful, but the path to get there is just ridiculously difficult these days. It seems like it's just so in like out of balance, like time spent with somebody you enjoy is wonderful. Even friends, just like, it's, it's so nice to be around people you like and people that light you up and, and like people you want to make out with on the couch. That's fantastic. But Finding your way to those people, I think, has become so difficult and arduous. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense that something so lovely is preceded by something so difficult that just I don't. It it just really doesn't make it really doesn't make sense to me how how dating has gone so far off the rails. Yeah, I think I think that's very very fair. I think whenever I think LA, so I live in LA and I moved here from New York, and New York was much easier for me because there were so you see so many people so often that you know, it's very easy to like not feel, at least for me, not feel alone because I could, you can make friends so fast. In LA, it was harder. And I noticed myself going through what you're talking about, which I, I was very frustrated that um, finding meaningful connection here was so difficult and it took me a really, really long time. And now I have a, an amazing community and I feel so blessed. Um, but yeah, like you should, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a drag. It's a, it's a, nightmare to have to go through all of these human interactions where you're just you're just not each other's vibes and and that's it's very just it's very disappointing dealing with mutual rejection over and over again you know 
there was that show recently on Netflix called The One where they matched you with like your perfect match based on your DNA. And I got to tell you, I didn't hate mm. the idea. I really didn't so hate funny. the idea at all. I mean, I hate it when they make shows about single people that are predicated around the fact that being alone is the most horrible and sad and pathetic thing ever. And, and all of you should fix it by having a partner, right? Like that makes me annoyed. There are no positive narratives about singlehood fucking ever. But I didn't hate the idea of like, you don't have to crawl across broken glass with lemon juice being squirted into the wounds before you can meet your partner. We can just match you based on your DNA. I was like, you know what? I don't hate it. What was that? There was that Netflix, the Black Mirror episode, Hang the DJ. Do you remember that one? Oh my right? God. Is I was that the right sick one? to my, yeah, I was sick to my stomach after. I really, I was physically was the, Ill. That's the Tinder one, right? With the, yes, yes, yeah. it was. I was, I was physically. So cool. Ill. I, I thought it was so cool. <laughs> Black so Mirror cool. is the only Why time. Why did you not like it? It's so cool because what do you mean afterward they're in love and then they didn't have to do any of the work? Yes, they did. In their minds, they spent oh. years and years and years of time. Oh, I thought the episode was there's like an AI of you that's made and then the AI does all the suffering. And then at the end, it's just like, hey, Shaney, here that you and him are a 98% match. Yeah, but like, I feel bad for the AI. I have to work on that. I have to work on that compassion. But yes, yes, I, I, yeah, it's true. I mean, it shows how bad dating is. Like, it is a long, yeah, it should take forever to find. It should take, yeah, I don't know. That, that's, what, that's part of why it's special though, right? If it was so easy to make human connection, regardless if it's romantic or not, um, it probably wouldn't feel as profound, you know? But sometimes it's effortless. Sometimes it's we've met on the train. Sometimes it's we met at work. Sometimes it's we met in yeah. college. We met in fourth grade. It just it, it's so it's so varied that it's hard to to narrow it down. Black. Yeah, Mirror, no, I agree with you. I think most of my closest friends, there was no like system systematized way of meeting them. You know, it's just like you go live a meaningful life, and then if you meet, I think I do actually believe in this though. If you meet someone who you have a connection with, whether it's at like at a bar, I met this I met this woman a few weeks ago at some brunch and we just hit it off so well in an hour like within we just talking and immediately like immediately i was like oh take her number dinner this week and now we're very good friends i think you have to cling right if someone makes you feel something you put your fucking nails into them you know like you <laughs> hold on tight <laughs> um cool i love that you made a friend in the wild i love stories like that it makes me really happy we're gonna need more of them when we get out of this this weird world that we're in because i mean even for somebody like me who's very much a homebody this was pushing it this was a bit yeah. too much this was especially with all the amb ambulances and recycling everywhere you know oh, God. <laughs> the noise. well i'm i'm leaving brooklyn because i think i've had my fill um and i'm going to a town that's probably no less noisy it's just different noise it's just yeah. different i'm looking garbage for trucks maybe a different yes type and like jazz sound. bands like just you know walking down the street in parade fashion because that's a, that's more fun loud. yeah right yeah. um yeah like anyone can throw a parade in new orleans anyone you can just like have a parade for whatever reason you throw a singles parade holy shit <laughs> holy shit you should oh god <laughs> I need a, a second with that. I'm like, what is this? oh my God, there's no way I'm not doing it now. Okay. Um, <laughs> New Orleans is going to have uh, a mess on its hands when I get down there. I, I just like the idea of, of moving to a town where it's like anyone can throw a parade for any, for any reason of any size. It could be three people. That's a parade. doesn't matter. If you awesome. want a parade, you can have one. I'll it. go. Let me know. Let, send me the date. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> um, what else do I want to talk to you about so much? I think... Um, Oh, I love, I love this part of the piece. You said it's a little crazy, imperfect, and yes, judgmental. My systematic approach may well be weeding out someone who could make me ha my happiest self, but the leaving it up to fate alternative of relying on chemistry, physical attraction, and serendipity hasn't led me to that person either. This basically indicates that you and I are on exact opposite sides of the dating coin um, because I tried to methodically date and it didn't work. So I chose serendipity. You didn't see success in serendipity. So you chose method. I think we're both right. I totally agree. Um, so the guy I am like pseudo almost seeing now did not come from a dating app, right? He didn't come from me searching for someone. He just came into my life. But I think that the important thing that I, the important thing for me here was like very clearly recognizing that I felt a feeling around him. And then I went back to my Trello board and I was like, which of these boxes does he check? 
right? And he checks all of them. Uh, and it's very nice. And even if we don't date, uh, like long term, right? If, uh, I think it's very cool to know what I'm looking for, uh, and to feel and to feel good that like I don't um, question that very much, you know. I think that's cool yeah. too. I'm I'm a bit jealous because like I I like to think in my head that I know what I want, but I've never put it down on paper. And I'm like, uh, am I missing something? Like I just. I'll just see. I'll just make a spreadsheet and just see because everything's changed, right? From before when I was using dating apps, it was like he has to be tall and like whatever else that I that I thought I wanted. I mean, there's there's certain deal breakers that are like actual like real life deal breakers that can't that I I won't break like the no kids thing. That's that's just a life thing. But like to write down all the others, how the person makes you feel and just sort of the vibe you get from them. I think that's, that's so important. And I haven't written it down and I think that maybe I should. So I think so. I mean, I don't want to give you advice, right? <laughs> You're the expert here. You um, but I think, I think the, um, a long time ago, I would write things down like, you know, is he Jewish or does he like, like, uh, is he in as good shape as I'm in? Right. Like things like this, that, you know, that just, uh, Maybe for some people those are important, right? And I don't, I don't mean to like judge you if they are. But for me, they they were never the things that made me feel something about someone, right? And so the things that made me feel someone is like, I'm, let me put my current Trello board what it says today. Um, and I don't know if this is totally accurate as according to the piece because it might be off, but it's knows what they want to do like for a job and mm -hmm. like even if they don't have that now, like they know what they want to do um they want a backpack we have the same humor via text um that's so they're good they're secure curious and dependable and kind's on there but i'm still i have to figure out if i really care about kind so i mean i know you're supposed to because it's like you don't want to date someone who's mean but like dependability for me has i think just for me specifically is more important than kindness because my insecurity lies in getting let down right not so much like um like I can handle if you're mean to me, like I can get over that. But I think the getting let down part, I'm not just like, we all have our little things that we're ticked by. And for me, it's like the forgiveness there is a thing I have to work on. And until that, I think I need that person to be that thing, you know? It's a lot harder to walk away from something if you, if you are not in a way looking for it. So if somebody disappointed you, but you hadn't like defined for yourself, no, this is not something that I want in my life or have to have in my life. You might just go along with it if you haven't identified that for yourself as something that's not going to fly. But because you have, that bell is going to trigger and you're going to say, you know what? No, this isn't for me. And I'm going to walk away from this. And I really, really respect and like that. I love, I mean, I just like organization and planning in general. But I've never I, thought like, about it like that. You're right. You're definitely right there. I've never thought about it like that, but you're totally right. Where there's like been relationships where I've been like, I don't know if I should leave. And then I go back to these pillars. And I think this one messed up my last two relationships and this person has the same we are misaligned on the same thing and i'm going to make the same mistake again I th i've never thought about it like that but you're definitely right it helps do you know how happy my mother would be if i brought home a nice jewish boy do you have any <laughs> idea like it's not a thing for me at all i no longer practice our religion but yeah. um i feel like it would just make a mom in fort worth texas super happy if, <laughs> if that were to happen Although, honestly, I don't think, I think now she's just like, now knowing what I do for a living, I think she's just like, if she's happy, I'm happy. I don't think there's yeah, a... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's... She takes what she can get. <laughs> <laughs> I will not, but she might. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Um, what do I want to talk to you about before I let... I don't want to let you go. I would like to keep talking to you forever. Um, but I know that my listeners have other podcasts in their queue, and I want to look at Oh, that's horrible kind of for them. Awful, right? Just insane. Um, actually, that's a great question. What podcast are you listening to right now? Because I feel like I keep going back to the same ones. I need to broaden my horizons a bit. Um, okay. My favorite comedian, who's super controversial, is Tim Dillon. I love him. He makes me laugh. I think he is the smartest, funny person today who's making fresh content. Uh, but he causes a lot of problems. He, a lot of people don't like him. So he's my favorite. <laughs> um, that's one I like. I'm I'm pretty boring with the daily with the daily podcasts like like the NPR one, Wall Street Journal one, um, American Life when I can. Um, I don't have anything to Tim Dillon. I think is the wreck that I would say I follow. He's um, 
I don't know. He, he's like mildly political, but more like politically. Pro- it seems like he ruffles feathers to ruffles feathers because to ruffle feathers because it's funny and he's good at it. Yeah. Um, he's gay and you wouldn't know it. He look. He seems like a Chris Farley type of personality. <laughs> he's very very obnoxious and funny and yeah. I'm I'll check it out. I will yeah. check it out. Um, if you, my favorite, one of my favorite comedians, particularly in the relationship space, is um, mm-hmm. Daniel Sloss. If you have not, I love him. The Jigsaw Netflix yeah. shows, yeah, so good. He's brilliant. Does he have a podcast? I'm sure he has. I mean, he's been on many, and in quarantine, I feel like most comedians started podcasts, so I'm sure he has one of his own. Um, if I knew how to get in touch oh, with him, God. I would ask him to be on this podcast. But I have no idea how to get in touch with Daniel. He's Foss. So talented. Yes, and when he made Jigsaw, he was like 26 years old. It's unfathomable. Like I was not, I was so far behind mentally and just watching him. I'm like, how the fuck do you already know this about life? Cause it's so true. His whole thing is like the worst thing you can do is spend your life with the wrong people because you just don't have to. I remember watching his episode, his show. And I was thinking like, please be gay, please be gay, please be gay. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, he wasn't so um i went to see him perform in new york um on valentine's day a few years ago i was like i i I was alone on valentine's day as i often am um and i was like you know what might be fun to go and see a comedian i really like by myself and daniel sloss had like a month-long residency at the time and i was like you know what i'm gonna go on valentine's day because that just sounds fun to me why not and the entire room entire room was women i don't think i saw a guy in attendance it was all women it was amazing just watching them freak out about this scottish dude it was so it was so funny um and so the show was, he, oh my god his every every stand-up special that i've seen him do is just phenomenal tell everyone where they can like keep up with you and your work online where they can uh obviously i'll link to the modern love piece because it's outstanding um but how can they how can they keep up with your work uh let's subscribe to my sub stack if it, so like for everyone who, need, who doesn't know it's like a newsletter thingy uh yeah i'm working on a bunch of different writing projects i'm gonna push them out on there first so yeah perfect um my stepdad sent me a link the other day and he's like have you ever heard of substack <laughs> I'm like i have actually he's like this might be great for you and i'm like if i have one more channel of content in my life my hair will spontaneously light on fire so i can't do this but i know many people who are using it and and loving it and so i just thought it was people cute swear by me. it and then yeah. i think journalists love writing about it because they're losing all this money too you know all the big <laughs> publications are losing so much money to substack so yeah well, that's because they've got issues within their own i mean can i ask Definitely. do you have a pet yeah i do not but i i'm a house sitting two pets right now if you see okay. them in this I'm like, is that a cat? Because I can spot a cat at 50 paces and I love them so much. It is a dog that yesterday vomited all over the bed. So that was awesome. Super cool. Yeah. Awesome. The joys of parenthood. Well, and on that, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We can do whatever we want. I run this ship. We can do whatever I say. And I say we can do that. Thank you so much for joining me. This was so much fun. And it was just a joy talking to you. Of course. Thanks, Shani. Thanks for having me. 